By now, I'm sure you have heard about what's happening between Israel and Hamas. We are following breaking news in the Middle East. The biggest and deadliest flare-up between Israel and the Palestinian militants in years. Oil prices have skyrocketed in the wake of this ongoing conflict as possible supply shocks loom. Fierce fighting continued for third day. Israel has the right to defend itself in accordance with international law. <laughs> Israel has bombarded the Hamas-run Gaza Strip with unprecedented airstrikes. I'm not here to take sides and who is wrong and right, but I'm going to talk about the impact that this will have on you and me. So let's get started. So in today's video, we'll be talking about oil and inflation. We'll be talking about the war and how it impacts oil and therefore inflation. I'll be breaking it down and we'll be talking about how it impacts you and me. And finally, I'll be talking about what homeowners and home buyers should do in today's market. In the last 12 months, I'm sure that you've heard this a lot that oil prices are impacting or gas prices are impacting inflation a lot. The inflation is up because of gas prices. And this was the case back in 2021. The headlines were the exact same inflation in Canada hits 4.7 amid soaring gas prices. And even if you look today, there's always a correlation between oil and inflation. And that's not just Canada, it's across the world. So let's try and understand why is that. In order to explain this in my next slide, what I've done is I've broken down CPI, which is consumer price index, which is related to inflation into what it constitutes. And if you look at this, energy only constitutes 7%. So the question is, why does oil or energy prices increasing impact inflation so much? And the answer to this is that energy actually impacts everything. It impacts transportation, which is 9% of CPI because nine of the 9%, almost half of it is gas prices that you put in your cars. And if crude oil prices go up, the gas prices also go up. Now you might say that that's only 10%, but that's not all. The other impact that increasing oil prices has is on plastic, it's on manufacturing. Because crude oil is a key ingredient in petrochemicals used to make plastic and Canadian economy is 45% dependent on manufacturing. So it impacts every single thing except maybe for shelter. So almost 60 to 70% of all categories that constitute CPI is impacted when crude oil increases because of its impact on manufacturing and the price of plastic. Increasing prices also increases the cost of logistics, the cost of packaging, the bottle that I have. There's a lot of plastic being used in this. It impacts every single thing. Now, in my past life, I used to work with retailers. All these big retailers like Walmart have 10 to 15% of their costs going towards logistics. And with gas prices increasing, the cost of transportation for them increases and therefore they have to increase the prices for everything. Even this mouse that I have, First of all, it's made of plastic and second of it has to be transported from one place to another and that is also dependent on gas prices and therefore you see everything increasing when crude oil prices increase. Now that we understand the correlation between oil and inflation, let's talk about the war that's happening. Now, like I said before, I am not here to take sides, but there is a massive impact of war on oil prices. Now, because of what happened between Ukraine and Russia, we already know that the oil supply from Russia is cut to the world and that has put a lot of pressure on the supply of oil and the demand remains high and therefore the oil prices were already increasing. Now, we already know that Biden has pledged support to Israel in this war and there's so much chatter that Iran supplied weaponry and training to Hamas for the attacks on Israel. What that means is that there's a very high chance that US will put sanctions on Iran and the supply of oil might be cut from the seventh largest producing oil country as well. And what that does is that Iran's allies, which are Iraq, can also cut supply. And what that does is all OPEC countries might cut supply to the world, partly due to sanctions by US and more importantly, the OPEC countries coming together and cutting supply. Now, I know that this is an extreme situation and many of these countries depend on their exports of oil for their economy as well. But if this escalates and this happens, we'll have a massive shortage of oil in the world and that would put upward pressure on the oil prices further. That would mean that there's no way that inflation is coming down anytime in the future. So this is the chart that shows six months of crude oil prices and you will see that the prices were actually going up 
up to $95. Now, average $50, $60 per barrel is the average of uh, crude oil prices, you know, before so much variability happened. But we hit about $95 a barrel and it started coming down and there were chatter, uh, you know, the economists were saying because the crude oil prices are coming down, everything will become cheaper and therefore it will put downward pressure on inflation and therefore the interest rates can come down and you all know that story. But with this Hamas and Israel thing that happened, we already saw that overnight the price of the oil increased by about two to three dollars almost four dollars you know overnight and already the experts were saying which is JP Morgan and this is September 22nd so this is before this Israel and Hamas thing happened they were already saying that oil might reach 150 dollars a barrel and like I said the problem is that these estimates were back in September 22nd so this situation this war situation had not happened yet and therefore, all the experts at that time were saying that these estimates are way too high. But now with the world split with this new development, I'm sure that these same experts will come out and say that it's very realistic that we achieve somewhere between 100 to 150 dollars a barrel of oil. And that's absolutely not going to help our cause. Now, I understand that this presentation is a lot of doom and gloom. But let's try and understand what does all this mean for you and me. So these are the series of events that I see. So if the oil prices keep going up, what would happen is that it will put upward pressure on inflation and it might remain high. Inflation might remain high for a much longer period of time. A lot of people were saying in January, February, March of next year, which is 2024, the inflation will start to come down and therefore the interest rates will come down. That might not happen. And obviously what that would do is interest rates will remain high or even increase further in order to reduce inflation. Now, of course, interest States has an impact on housing market, but a bigger impact will be on businesses who live on line of credits, manufacturing companies who need line of credits to fund their supplies. So more businesses will start to go out of business and therefore there will be job cuts and unemployment. What that would do is we'll hit an official recession and Bank of Canada this time cannot print money to get out of recession because if they print more money, they'll actually increase inflation even more and worsen the problem instead of solving it. And I've actually made an entire video on this. We'll see a lot of economic pain. There'll be high default rates on homes. There'll be more home sellers. There'll be less home buyers. There'll be more tenants who are not paying their rents. There'll be more landlords who will not be able to sustain their homes at these high interest rates and tenants not paying. And there'll be more inventory in the market and it will be a true buyer's market and the market can actually lose a lot of its value. Now, of course, I'm making a massive assumption that this particular situation with Israel is escalated to a level where all this happens. I really hope that this war stops. I really hope that there was no war in the world at all. But the reality is that we need to prepare for the worst. And this is the worst case scenario. Now, let's talk about home ownership now. If you are an existing homeowner, which is that you actually got a house in the last two to five years, I would not recommend to make any big moves right now, especially with your primary home. So if you are looking to change a house, you are looking to upgrade a house, do not do that right now till the time we know what's happening with this situation and whether it gets escalated or it gets diffused. The second important thing, and this is something that the second important thing, and now more than ever, we need to protect income. What that means is if you are in a job, if you are a contractor, if you are in a job where there are layoffs happening in your company, you need to make sure that you are in a job or you are in a place where you're not laid off. And now more than ever, we need to start a side hustle because if inflation goes up, everything gets expensive and we need to have a secondary source of income to supplement all the additional expenses that we are anticipating in the next couple of years. Now, of course, you would say that Navjot, it's easier said than done. And yes, it is. So therefore, I have made an entire video on how to think about starting a side hustle. So do watch that video. The link is in the description below. Now, in this particular market, cash is king invest for cash flow. Look for opportunities where you can actually add value. Look for houses which are older and you can add value by putting in a little bit of renovations or building the basement and hence improving the value of the house while also generating cash flow from that investment. So many millionaires are made during a recession. So make sure that you are sitting on the cash that you have. And the fourth and the most important thing, something that I'm super excited about because despite my research, I don't know the extent of the hole that we have dug for ourselves. Therefore, it's really important that we learn we surround ourselves with the amazing 1% thinkers and not FOMO creators because honestly, even though there's economic pain, even though we might lose our jobs, even though we might go into debt, even though I as a mortgage agent don't make enough money next year, I know that we'll survive this. We are part of history and I know that in 2030, 2040, when there are more recessions because this is not the last recession, we'll be a lot wiser and we'll have ample opportunity to make a lot of money in subsequent recessions. So therefore, it's really important that you surround yourself with the right kind of people who have the positive mindset who has a learning mindset
mindset who you can learn from so that you become a little bit more wise the next time we are in a similar economy. But if you have cash, then all the more reason you need to surround yourself with those people because then you can actually make some money in the next two years. Now, this is one question as a mortgage agent, I get a lot that is it the right market to buy? So if you are in the market to buy, there are certain things that you need to take care of. So the number one thing that you need to do is you need to talk to an expert team who is putting you ahead of the commissions. I'm a mortgage agent and if you fill the form below, someone from my team will reach out to you and they'll make sure that they are putting you ahead of their commissions because that's how I have trained them. Now, if you're in the market to buy, make sure that you're buying value real estate right now. What I mean by that is you need to buy resale homes only. No pre-construction, I'll talk about that in a bit. You need to buy poorly staged homes because fancy homes attract more bidding and you don't want to get into a bidding war and pay higher in this particular market. So make sure that you are looking for poorly staged homes that require a little bit of renovations. You are looking for homes with unfinished basements where you can, you know, in the next two years, build that basement, save a little bit of money, take a little bit of, you know, line of credit and just build the basement, improve the value of the property. If you put thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to build that basement, your value of the property, especially in Ontario, increases by about $100,000. So you have put $60,000 of additional equity in your property. So even if the property values go down by 10%, because the value that you created, not the market you created, will stay with you. Now, if you look at House Sigma right now, you'll see that there's a lot of condos on the market. There is so much inventory on condos. That means that you will get a really good price on them. So it's not a terrible time to buy condos, especially assignment sales, because there are a lot of distressed people who cannot close houses, who want to uh, assign the properties. So there's a massive opportunity to buy a really good condo. Make sure that you're doing less than 10 years of condo because then the strata fees and everything increases. Um, but yeah, it's a really good time, especially for first time home buyers to look at condos um, as a potential place to start. Now, like I said before, I would say no pre-cons right now. We don't know where the market is going. You don't want to overbuy or overpay for a particular house that you can actually get at a discount in the next couple of months. So no pre-cons at all, irrespective of where you are right now, I would not recommend pre-cons, especially what's happening in Israel. We just don't know where the market is gonna go and we just don't know whether this particular wall will escalate or diffuse. And the last one, and this is, I'm just reiterating the same thing that I talked earlier, where I said you need to buy poorly staged houses, do not buy fancy staged houses because that will attract bidding war and you don't want to get into a bidding war in this particular market. And I actually made an entire video and I'll link that in the description below, but it's not the worst idea for the first time home buyers to invest for cash flow. Instead of you living in the house, you actually put that house on rent and you invest for cash flow in markets where things still cash flow or they have potential to cash flow. Now there's one key reason why I'm seeing that and the reason is that if you buy a house and you put it on rent and if it cash flows or only cash flows neg negative or break even or whatever right zero dollars hundred dollars two hundred dollars of cash flow negative that's fine but if you lose your job then you at least don't have to pay a five thousand six thousand dollars of mortgage payment you can rent with three thousand dollars in a nice townhouse or you know a two-bedroom condo and you can sustain the $200, $300 of negative cash flow on the investment property. And the moment you get your job, you are ahead of the curve again. And the second more obvious reason is that let's say if the market goes down, there'll still be renters. So you don't have to sell the house if the market goes down because there's cash flow negative. You can still sustain the property because you're still getting rents and you're still being able to sustain the property because there's still cash flow in the property. So there's no urgency to sell if you buy for cash flow. So those are the two reasons where as a first time home buyer, it's not a terrible idea to invest for cash flow. But please note that you still need 20% down payment for that. So if you don't have that, I would highly recommend that you save for that or you buy for yourself, but make sure that you're looking at those green points on the screen before you buy a house. And last but not the least, irrespective of where you are, do not buy out of FOMO. Look at your situation, talk to an expert team, book a call from the description below, and we'll make sure that we advise you on your situation without looking at our gains. That's all I have for today. Milte hain agli video mein. Tab tak ke liye. Bye-bye.